So, um, obviously, desiccate, if you're trying to desiccate the weed, dry it out, that's only going to work real, real well if, if the, the, the soil's got some dryness to it, if it's pretty damp, um, it's less likely. If you've got thunder clouds on the horizon, you're seeing a lightning flash on the corner of your eye, and, the, and you're out there trying to finish the field, well, you know, you're going to get a lot of rerouting of those weeds because they're not going to dry out if that's what you're trying to do. Um, uh, on the other hand, you know, if you're in a situation where you want to cultivate very close to the road, um, you're not going to be wanting to dig deep enough to, to pull the roots out. And dismemberment is a good option. You want to be real shallow so that you're not tearing up your crop roots. You just, you know, pulling, pulling the weeds next to the road. So different situations. You want to be doing different things. Spring, uh, a, a spring shank like this, light steel, light spring steel. Uh, these S shanks, although they're heavy S shanks that behave very differently. Um, uh, but the light S shanks, sometimes called the Danish uh, shank, uh, they vibrate as they go through the soil. Right? They're designed to do that. Um, so, so you know, the shovel there is, or the sweep is, is moving back and forth. You know, maybe half an inch as it's going through the soil, and that's going to. Uh, it, it's not only going to uproot, it's going to kind of shake the weed free of the soil. And that's one of the advantages of that kind of tool. On the other hand, this is a terrible machine for if you've got large weeds that you're trying to cut because, uh, or, or uproot because it doesn't work very well if you put it in deep. You're liable to bend the shank if you've got a lot of draft. Um, and the, uh, and you know, if you've got a big dandelion or a dock or something like that with a big cab root, these, these things are flexible enough they'll just walk right around it. On the other hand, something with heavy steel, this is an S shank, but it's, you know, the steel is very, it's like, you know, it's designed to deflect if you hit some, you know, boulder, but otherwise it's going to stay in place. Um, or a C, heavy C shank and big, uh, sweeps, they're going to cut through anything. Um, and if you want to throw a lot of soil, uh, a disc hiller, um, you can throw a lot of soil in around, you know, potatoes or, or uh, sweet corn or whatever. Very a lot of weeds with it. Um, and if the crop can take a lot of burial, like buried a lot of weeds that you wouldn't have been able to get, and that's in real weed control, and, and that's something that's pretty desirable. So, uh, Fred and, and, um, and Robert asked me to say a little bit about beds and row spacing. Um, I think, you know, you've got to have something that works with the, with the machinery you've got, although more ideally you can buy the tractor to fit what you want to do, but I know that that doesn't always happen. Um, most vegetable production, in New, fresh market vegetable production in New York is on beds. Um, and you're going to have different crops on different row spacings, and this is just a for example. It's going to depend on what the width of your bed is, um, and so forth. But the, uh, the point is, you're going to have different. Uh, you're going to be planting different numbers of rows on different beds, and if you've got a belly-mounted cultivator, it really makes a lot of sense to have multiple toolbars set up. Um, may not be something you can do, you know, if you're just getting started, but if you, you've got a little bit of cap home, you've got some, you know, some opportunity, toolbars are pretty inexpensive, you know, it doesn't cost a lot for a toolbar or, or to weld one together. And, you know, having multiple toolbars, one set up for, ones that are set up for different spacing, when you go from one crop to another, because a lot of you are growing a lot of different crops, when you go from one crop to another, it just saves you an enormous amount of time. You're not sitting there in the barn fooling around with a wrench for hours and hours trying to get the cultivator set up for doing the different row spacing. And then, you know, tomorrow you may have to go back to the to the, to the other row spacing you just took apart. Um, you want to be able to set up a system so that you can cultivate. If you're using plastic, you want to be able to, to have your system set up so that um, you could either put plastic on that bed or not put plastic on the bed and not have to completely 
you know, go to a different tractor with a different set of machine and off the whole routine. And just some basic considerations, things to think about. One thing uh, is that some crops, and I think potatoes and sweet corn are two of them, it's hard to be hard to be efficient with your with your land area um, if you're growing these things on beds because uh, you don't need as much space between the beds and it's hard to put more than one row on a bed and still do what you need to do with it. So um, your land area may be set up with beds, but then there may be another part that has a different crop rotation that's, that's dealing with crops that are more efficiently grown in an open field sort of situation. Um, just you know, farm design issues that you might think about when you're trying to figure out how you're going to do all this. And, and some people have, like Fred uh, here, has these grass strips. This is this is Blue Heron Farm, a very successful farm in Seneca County. Um, they have these permanent grass, their whole farms laid out with these permanent grass strips. Um, and then, uh, you know, here they, here they got cover crop that's rye on, on some strips, and here are some in production, and so forth. Um, and the advantage of that is, uh, you got control wheel traffic, so you're not driving on the areas where you're you, you, you're planting your crop, and that means that the soil quality improves in the in the areas where you're growing the crop, because you're not impacting it with the, the wheel traffic, and it also is nice because you're not walking on it and getting a lot of compaction just from people walking on the field. And you, you know, vegetable production, all going in there with your pulley. Harvesting, there's a lot of people walking and sitting and stuff on the ground. So it, um, there's a lot of compaction just from that. Uh, makes picking easier. It's nice if you got a U pick situation where you know your, your customers can come in, they sit on the grass, they pick out of the, out of the bed, and uh, they don't get all muddy. That makes them happy. Um, and biodiversity. Um, and one of the things that, that these strips do. Um, you know, you can have some flowering plants like white clover in there and that will um, attract beneficial insects, but it also shelters these ground beetles that forage out into the, into the, the till area and eat weed seeds. And these things are voracious. They eat thousands of weed seeds a year. One beetle can eat thousands of weed seeds a year. There, uh, that, those are all advantages. Of course, there are some disadvantages. Um, <coughs> you got to mow the grass. Um, otherwise, it grows up and goes to seed and dumps. And you get, maybe you could say something about how you control your weeds along the edge. Yeah, well, it's this tool right here. Very basically, we have a point here. The wheels on this uh, on this tine weeder run on the grass strip, but the uh, generally what's called the wheel eraser is not behind the wheels. It runs at the edge of the beds, and that and that I call this a bed keeper. And so that that we run that regularly down and it keeps the uh, the, the grass and the clover in the in the wheel tracks from encroaching into beds. I've seen people use uh, disc killers or, or bed breeze spiders um, for that too. Um, how, do you, how do you maintain the grass strips that you have? Uh, what do you mean, say maintain? Like mow and well, I just mow. Just mow it with like a riding mower. Push mower. In this case, it's only two feet wide. Oh yeah. But, but but a good buddy gave me uh, uh, some advice on how to do that. You don't want to be blowing it onto that. So my, my I have a, a particular type that if you put the bag on, it goes in the bag. But I don't want to bag it, so I cut the bottom out of the bag. It blows into the bag, but it just drops right back down on the grass uh, instead of blowing into your vegetables. Yeah, you have a lot of uh, a lot of area to do. You want to make your grass strips wide enough you can take them off. You might not think of in terms of cultivation, but it's it's related. It's mechanical weed management. Is uh, to clean weed seeds out of the soil. Um, and there are two there are two related techniques. One is called uh, one is till fallow, and with that you till the ground and then um, uh, you know prepare a seed bed, and then the seeds the seedlings weed seedlings come up and then you till again and kill, those, kill that first flush of weed semen. And maybe you do that two or three times and then plant the crop. Um, you want to do it shallowly so you're not bringing up, when you do the cultivation, you don't want to bring up 
a lot of weed seeds. You want to do it shallowly so that you exhaust the weed seeds in the, in the soil surface. Um, you won't get all of them. Some of them, there will be dormant seeds that germinate later in the season, but you can really reduce the, the density. Um, and I'll say more about the tools we use for this in a minute. And then the other approach is what's called a stale seed bed, and these are often confounded by people. But a stale seed bed, you basically do the same thing. You, you start the same way, you create a seed bed, make it firm so that the, you get good soil weed seed con uh, contact, and then, um, and then the, the, the weeds come up, and then you flame them, either flame them or use some kind of herbicide to kill them, kill them off. And, and now there are a bunch of OMRI certified, for, for you folks that are organic, there are a bunch of OMRI certified uh, burn down herbicides now. They're quite expensive, but for a high value crop, usually this is used on a very high value crop. Chuck, yeah. have, you, have you actually used some of those um, OMRI food burn downs? No, my colleague Robin Blender <coughs> has been doing a lot of work with them, and so I just figured she's got it covered. Do you know, have you heard any about the results when she makes a plunk with them? Um, being effective? Yeah, they can be effective. Um, pretty high cost per acre. Um, so, you know, you probably wouldn't want to use it on anything but a pretty valuable crop um, because you need to use pretty concentrated stuff. You know, if it's an acetic acid type herbicide, you want it to be probably 15, 20 percent acetic acid. Um, you dilute it down to vinegar strength, it's just not going to kill the weeds. Think for uh, the clove oil, lemongrass oil type, it's I think 30 gallons of product per acre or something, so it's pretty expensive. You know, maybe a directed spray in the row might be a way to go. Um, if the crop's high enough that you can spray it in close to the ground. I mean, I think they probably do have application. Um, the weed seed things have to be small. It doesn't work against perennials because it just burns the top down and they re-sprout. Re um, and they, they, for the uh, for seedlings, once they're above about four true leaves, you're probably not going to kill them. It may burn them back, but they'll recover. Um, for cotyledon to two true leaves stage, you can kill them pretty good. Four leaves, maybe if you use a concentrated solution. That's about all. You know, that's that's kind of what I gathered from her research and, and other colleagues that have been working on it. Chuck, actually, Robin got that from me. <laughs> what? The vinegar thing. I, I had a SARE project in 2003, uh -huh. and she was my advisor, and, and uh, she took that on a little farther, and she had a grad student. But I'm using 10% of city gas of vinegar, and I have a barrel over there, and uh -huh. sprayers over here. Just I, I have been 100% successful with broad leaves huh. at 10% at, uh, at, at straight. And how big, how big are they when you? Well, I mean, obviously the smaller the plants, the more effective it is, but I've been able to kill uh, both bull and, and uh, Canada thistle that were three or four feet high. Uh, you know, burn them back. I mean, well, you're right. Actually, it doesn't kill them. You might have to hit them a couple of times. It'll burn them back. Yeah, because they're deep cap roots and they'll re-sprout. But, but we, we had 100% success on, and we use it in garlic only. Because, it, because the reason we use it in garlic, because it doesn't hurt the garlic, but it kills all the broad leaves. And we're getting it, obviously, we're trying to, we call it, call it, cotyledon stage is obviously the, the, uh, the most successful time to hit them, but you can hit them when they're a little later. But it must be repeated that this stuff will kill everything else. The reason it didn't kill the vinegar is because vinegar is waxy and it rolls off. Rotten vinegar. <laughs> the garlic didn't kill the vinegar, yeah. Um, did everybody understand that? <laughs>